Alrighty, so we're getting to the point now where these iPhones are so fucking big that this small tripod that I have is gonna collapse when I try to put it on. So, I don't know, hopefully, hopefully this works. Hopefully I look somewhat presentable for this video. So, alrighty, let's do it. So I'm gonna talk about my 10 favorite screen film villains today. Um, try to keep this under like six hours because when I talk about things, they tend to go on for a pretty long time. So, um, I think I did this once. I, did, I think I did this as a tribute video. And then I was like, well, I guess we'll just do it as an actual discussion video. So, alrighty. Um, how are we going to talk about this? I guess we'll just go start. Um, it's Halloween season, kind of, sort of, almost like a week or so away. So, I have other videos I want to do. And I think that it'll be fun to talk about villains. Actually, you can see some shit behind me. There's an Orlock and a queen and stuff anyway uh number 10 is uh jack griffith the invisible man i don't am i gonna insert clips in this i don't i don't know maybe i will insert clips i'm gonna have to download clips all right i'll download 10 clips or something whatever well okay the invisible man's a crazy fucking movie um really really crazy for its time period i think he, the body count for jack griffith is like 200 or something over 100 200 it's pretty crazy for a movie from the 30s for some character to kill like hundreds of people but he does and claude reigns of course is just absolutely incredible um the voice acting because of course you don't see him so they had to find an actor that had like the greatest voice ever and uh claude reigns voice is phenomenal the character is so funny and yet so much in that like world war ii sort of like hitler-esque you know dominating the world sort of thing so he's really threatening and really scary um all the special effects are incredible i still don't really understand how they did it i mean i kind of do but at the same time it's like the like matte black velvet that they had to film like six times or something it's, it's fucking wild so jack griffith's a great villain um the invisible man is just a great movie so that is my number 10 spot Number nine is Minnie Castavet from Rosemary's Baby. A Rosemary's Baby was a movie that when I saw it, I was like, oh, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's definitely a different kind of horror movie, which is why I like it so much, because it's not, um, it's, it's more like you, what you don't see is scary, kind of like The Exorcist 3 or whatever. It's like, doesn't show you basically anything. But I think that Minnie Castavet is a great villain because well first of all she's like one of those like twist character villains which um <laughs> twist things which it's interesting because when you have a character that's supposedly the good guy and then they reveal at the end of the movie to be the bad guy they change personality so much that it it, it becomes kind of ridiculous it's like I, I don't know it's like you're a completely different character now that you're like a bad guy than a good guy and the thing about Minnie Castavet is that she's in a witch cult, obviously a Satan worshiping witch cult, trying to, you know, bring the Antichrist into the world. And yet when shit hits the fan at the end of the movie, spoilers, um, her personality doesn't change in the slightest. And I, I don't, nobody really seemed to talk about that, where it's like, why would it change? Like, it's just, a, she's just a, like a religious person, obviously, and it's a fantasy, so she's a, you know, a witch. But it wouldn't change and that's what makes the character so scary is that she's still the same person that she was before but now you know that she is a satanist devil worshiping cult member and it's horrifying because it's like anybody you know at any point could be something that you know you don't know because their personality is going to change when you find out this um horrible thing about them or some shit like that so i think Minnie cast a great character and uh, Ruth Gordon obviously just fucking kills it. So, yeah. Number eight, I have a screen with the pictures of them, so I don't forget who's in what order. The order doesn't really matter, except for number one anyway. But, and of course, number one is the most obvious fucking thing in the world from this channel. But anyway, number eight is Norma Desmond from Sunset Boulevard. You know, I'm ready for my close up, Mr. Bunnell. Um, Oh, God, how the hell do you even talk about? This is a rare movie because the villainess is the also the star of the film pretty much. Um, oh god, I, Norma Desmond is crazy because it's just one of those performances where she's just doing things in the movie that you know, could never work at any other time. All those like silent film gestures and, and, and big acting, and yet the character is like any great movie monster is completely utterly tragic. The delusion of 
her own success, you know, being completely gone. And people, it's weird because in the movie, maybe it was different back then, I don't know. But there's at one point in the film where somebody's like, oh, I thought Norma Desmond was, was dead. And it's like, it's 1950. She was famous, like, in the 30s, like, up to the 30s, 20 years. Like, how, I don't know. It's like, people nowadays, maybe because of nostalgia, maybe there just wasn't a nostalgia thing back then, I'm not sure. But it's like, she said, she would not be forgotten by the public completely if this was a movie that or an actor that um was around nowadays. They would not be forgotten as much as Norma Desmond is. It's almost like she's been gone for like a hundred years or some shit. But yeah, just not being able to accept aging, not being able to accept you know growing up and and changing and, and being stuck in the past. She's completely stuck. Her whole house is like a tomb, a shrine or whatever that you know she she's given to herself. So that's a fascinating uh, commentary as well. But I just, I'm so bad at describing these characters. I just think you just watch the movie. It's its really effective. And um, obviously Gloria Swanson gives one of the great performances of all time. So number seven is the one of two animated characters that I would put on such a list. I don't, if I did a hero's list or something, I would, you would maybe get... Snow White. I don't, I don't know who the fuck I'd put on the list of any characters that are anime. I don't know. I have to think about it. I'm very picky when it comes to animation. So number seven is Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians. Um, of all the villains, I, I did my Disney villain video a year ago or two. I, I don't remember. And Cruella was in the second spot on that video as well. I only really think the studio ever made two great villains. And I think that Cruella is a different type of... Well, first of all, she's a funny villain. A funny villainess. But funny in her personality as opposed to being a joke. She's never a joke in the film. She's more just like a force of nature. And the, the funniness comes from the exaggerated nature of the character as opposed to her falling down and all kinds of shit. There's only one scene in the whole film of any slapstick that involves the character. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. But no, it's, it's, it's more or less the satire. It's the... The caricature of it you know the person that you know we all know someone like this maybe we have tendencies that are like this um and the person that doesn't doesn't uh shut up or let anybody else talk um and that is fascinating and obviously the animation is fucking incredible and the voice acting is just beyond i've always said there's betty lagerson should have gotten an oscar nomination for that voice i mean the voice acting is so good, and the, the writing, especially in those early scenes, is so strong that it, again, it's one of those examples of why it should have ended once Walt Disney was gone. I mean, you just weren't, you weren't going to be able to capture that anymore and even come close to it. And um, as I get older, it's like the stuff, tar the, the whole Disney thing, and it just kind of irks me now because it's like, it's just such a zombie. You know, the movie's made for, like, children, and uh, Walt Disney was trying for a higher standard. Um, and I think Corel is a great example of that. And she's also a self-destructive character as well. You know, she can't be destroyed at the end by the heroes. Um, I mean, the dogs could have just ate her. But, you know, they're not going to do that in the movie. It's, it's a Holocaust kind of allegory and stuff. So you're going to get, you know, them running for their lives, basically. But she does herself in. Doesn't die or anything. Um, I don't really think the character would make sense if she died. Though I don't mean weird. But, yeah, self-destructive, so... All right, so we did 10, 9, 8, 7, we're up to 6. 6 is the final uh, universal character, or the monster character, and it's Dracula. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, I'm obsessed with Dracula. I um, adore Dracula. I still don't know what clips in of this. This might just be a video of me talking. I don't... It's really just my video, just me talking. I'm not going to do any editing on this video. It might just be me, me blabbing or whatever. Um. Oh, God, Dracula is, is fantastic. Lugosi with the hands, like, you know coming at you and stuff is is wild i don't he, all his facial expressions and stuff it's it's such a singular performance and i do think that dracula um i want to do a whole commentary next month on dracula i'm sure to watch the film and talk about it but it is like the most classic movie you can ever see in your life because the movie is kind of messy um but the dracula character he's just so individual and distinctive and just so totally like just himself in that movie and there's like nothing else like it if anybody else even tried to do something like that it would come across as like really weird and strange and off-putting so i just think that the dracula right the fucking fan went on the ac right um the dracula character is just so singular and i think that lugosi just 
was more responsible probably for the creation of the American horror genre than even the film itself. I think he just propelled it into a level that um, is quite strong. So yeah, I gotta put something in here, right? I gotta put a clip. Maybe I'll just download some pictures and just shove them on the side of my face instead of putting an image. I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Probably that. I'll probably just download like 10, 10 images or something and just throw it in there. All right, so number five. I was a little bit conflicted with number five because I didn't know what Orson Welles I wanted. I didn't know if I wanted Harry Lawrence from The Third Man or, uh, would you believe I forgot his fucking name? Hank Quinlan. <laughs> Hank Quinlan from Touch of Evil. And I went with Hank Quinlan from Touch of Evil mainly because I feel like the character is just a bit more tragic than um, Harry Lyme is. Uh, I like that sort of thing. You know, the corrupt border sheriff who is harboring feelings of the past, you know, hatred from the past and then can't get over it. And of course that leads to, you know, corruption and racism and all kinds of nonsense. So I think that Orson Welles does a great job. Obviously he's in um, heavy makeup in this. I think he told a story once, my nose is now itching. I think he told a story once about how he um, went to a party once in that makeup and people didn't even realize that he was wearing it. That's fucked. He's really grotesque in the movie and disgusting. And everyone in the film is, is phenomenal. Um, Dietrich is great. Uh, Tron Heston. Uh, what the fuck is Janet Lee? Um, my boy, jo Joseph Kalea, uh, is phenomenal. Just a great movie. And I think Orson Welles is great in that role. Um, and I just wanted, I, I was, felt weird to not have an Orson Welles in my top spot for, for characters, anyway, for villains. Anyway, I think he's a strong character. So number four is, um, The Swimmer. The Swimmer, Burt Lancaster as The Swimmer. What the hell is Burt Lancaster's name in The Swimmer? I'm gonna have to put it on the screen. I don't remember Burt Lancaster's name at all. I don't even, wait, hold on. Why does he not, wait. Hold on, I'm gonna look this up since the computer is right here. I don't want to switch to Chrome. Son of a bitch. Wait, the swimmer. This is a little weird, but it's like, what the fuck is the swimmer? Oh, it's Ned, Ned Merrill. I, I thought he was just like Guy in the film. Ned Merrill. Okay, so the swimmer, I gotta get the picture back up. The swimmer is crazy. now. With um, a character like this and the next one, you know, you wouldn't maybe see them on villains list, but I wanted to put them on the list because I, I do feel like they're villains um, in a different kind of way, more not as, as strong like a, a villain presence as maybe Orson Welles was or something or Corella, but um, how do I talk about this character? It, it's self-destruction. It's the, it's an allegory for the, you know, the American middle class kind of upper class dream being a joke. Uh, the character is delusional. Um, he starts off thinking he's the great. Ba basically, you're watching his whole life play out in scenes of him, um, like going into people's pools and interacting with people. And slowly, as the movie goes on, the people that he interacts with, you know, treat him worse and worse. And you realize at the end of the film that he basically is not what he seems, and that he was spoiling the whole movie and he lost everything. But it's that cockiness and that self assurance and that inability to understand reality around him and what he's done and his actions to people that have affected them is what makes the character a villain per se or a, a tragic thing or something i mean li listen none of these characters on this list that i have here are not they don't have human quality they all have human qualities and the idea of, of making a film villain list is kind of weird because it's like, how, what the fuck is a villain? I don't know. Like, it's something that does bad things. It's like every human does things to a varying degree that are bad. So, but every single one of these characters I wouldn't have on this list if they didn't have some kind of quality to them that represents something that's human. And of course, this is that. And, you know, Dracula has the, um, the wants to die, can't die sort of thing. A Corella represents the 1%. Uh, Norma Desmond, of course, is tragic, but... Uh, this Ned character is basically just the disillusionment of a certain type of person and a certain type of time period that was that had ended and had been built on, you know, giant swimming pools and shit and falsehoods and rich uh, yuppies or whatever the hell, whatever the word is, rich cocks. <laughs> okay. Um, number three is the other one I was going to talk about that I wouldn't... I, 
he's more or less a, a villain as sorta kinda but not at the same time and that is the character that Dorothy Malone plays in um I want to get her that way and I want to get her name right too I don't want to fuck up her name and written on the wind which she won the academy award for let's see I don't want to get her I want to say something and then yeah Merrily Hadley I was gonna say Hadley but I didn't know what the fuck her first name was um oh god she's the nympho who picks up men in her convertible um and schemes and, and plots and tries to get Rock Hudson even though Rock Hudson is not only not in love with her but of course you know not straight <laughs> if I don't know if that was supposed to be like subtextual but it's like if you're not getting with Dorothy Malone there's definitely something happening here but the character does have a change of heart after she like sambas her father to death or whatever dances while her father's having a heart attack on the steps um what I think is the most fascinating thing about Dorothy Malone in this role and it's not even something that you would know about if you watch the movie it's behind the scenes thing and it's the fact that Dorothy Malone was not comfortable um playing this character she was more conservative and didn't think that she could that she couldn't or that she wanted to be someone who was of this person you know, like personality you know sexual sort of thing you don't get that at all in the film that is not apparent in the performance in the slightest which i'm glad she won the academy award for the performance i'm, I'm glad it happened but she did not have, if that was the type of actress that she was she was that good she did not have the career that she deserved and i think it's a shame i, I don't know how you play that it, there would be never for one second when you're watching the movie to not to think that this character is basically a religion or the, the actors playing the character is religious and, and more um you know um i don't i don't know if the word is just not promiscuous or whatever so anyway I, I i think she's great in that role so number two is michael keaton as beetlejuice Whew. okay so the new one had come out what like a week or two ago three weeks ago um it's the the film the original film is phenomenal uh, the, the, the i was gonna say the remake the sequel is good he still has it um it's toned down a lot from the first movie um the beetlejuice in the original film is very sexual very perverted um he's just gross but michael keaton's energy in that role and just the zaniness of it i just i find it infectious i think and i love lydia and i love the cartoon actually, I actually like lydia better from the cartoon and like the keaton version in the movie better but I just love it and I think that that it's not randomness per se but it is it's zany just throwing everything out there and seeing what sticks sort of thing and it's got such a crazy production design and I've never been like a big Tim Burton fan I really like the movie Ed Wood mostly because I just like Lugosi but I, I think that Beetlejuice is a great film and I've seen it several times now and it's like okay I do love this movie like I saw it for the first time I was like oh this is I didn't think I was gonna like this and then I saw it again and again and yeah it's, it's amazing uh, he's not in the movie very much, Michael Keaton, and it's another one of those things where it's, it's, um, well, it's a tradition, um, it used to be anyway, I don't know what it is now, but back in the day that your, um, fantasy villain or your, you know, your villain would not be in the film as much, um, as one might think. Of course, this is like Dracula, well, no, not Dracula, not like Ghost Dracula, um, Orlock, uh, the Wicked Witch, um, the Queen, maybe Casper Gutman, I don't remember, obviously Harry Long from The Third Man, they're in the movie for about 15 minutes maybe and um you get so much presence from those characters and beetlejuice is only in the movie i think for 14 minutes and uh he's really effective so that's number two i love beetlejuice all right so now we have number one it's the most obvious thing in the world i can grab a little piece that's right here <sighs> um i've talked at nauseam um about this character I think she is the greatest villain in the history of cinema. I think that she is the most important animated character, actually, in the history of cinema. I think that if this character didn't exist the way that she was, and had they gone with the original version of the character that was going to be the fat, frumpy, you know, Queen of Hearts thing, that we wouldn't have animated cinema the way that we do. Um, which actually might be a bit of a curse, too, because, like, it became a joke but that listen america is always spinning its wheels if they, they ripped off walt disney they didn't know what they were doing 
man, the queen is an interesting one because you have um, the one time Walt said, the one time he vowed after he made Snow White that he was never going to make another realistic villain of that level again. I'm not particularly sure why, but I do think that the story of Snow White lends itself to having a villainess that can be tragic and can represent something more than even what the story represents, of course, because the film is an allegory for the Great Depression and the um, incoming World War II, and obviously the Queen is a fascist dictator with the, you know, tragic insecurity foibles and, you know, turns herself into a witch because she assumes that the only thing that makes her important is beauty, so you have to give all that up, but at the same time, it ends up basically turning her into death itself to kill innocence, and also it ends up freeing her. And you know that the character, had she succeeded, well, she did succeed, she did kill Snow White, but I mean, had she lived beyond that point, would have turned herself right back into the queen and been miserable the next day. It, she couldn't... Well, it, it's, it's interesting that you had, she had to become hideously ugly to then not need to hide anymore behind that mask and free herself. But ultimately, she had everything she wanted, and she could have just been happy the way that she was, and she just wasn't. And you could say that's society as well. I mean, like, you know, how did you get to this point where you're listening to a slave in a magic mirror basically tell... Because the mirror... The mirror isn't telling her that Snow White is more attractive. He's just saying that she's more fair. And to the queen, that's just... A, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beauty thing, but it's all, also... She, she sold her soul, so it's like she doesn't have, like, this understanding or this... To her, those things are weaknesses, goodness, kindness, and then beauty is, is an important thing. And with Snow White, there's no awareness that she even is beautiful. And the kindness and the goodness is just there. So the queen can't have what Snow White has because she's a horrible monster who's insecure and, and jealous and all that kind of stuff. And that's tragic, but she wants to then, you know, kill Snow White and then hopefully that'll bring that to her, and it doesn't. It ultimately just end up destroying her. There's a lot of things to think about with the character that is not there in any of the other villains that the studio ever made. Like I said, Corella is the only other one that is a great character, but it's a different type of thing. It's satirical and that sort of thing. So anyway, yeah, the Queen is um incredible. I just love her. I love her design, obviously. I'm in both forms. I love the, the apple and the, the everything. It's just so fucking badass. Um... And I love the voice acting, of course. It's just phenomenal in the animation and everything. She just is the only time that I've ever seen an animated character, really truthfully, that I feel like it's like a real person. It's like, that was a drawing. It, it's really, especially when you get to, because it's a fantasy, it really fucks with me. Like, it has such a power to it that I totally believe in everything that's happening in the movie. You just totally buy every single thing she's going through, every feeling, every emotion. And it's it's pretty tragic. It's pretty fucked up. So anyway, that's the list. So we went with um, The Invisible Man, Minnie Castavet, Norma Desmond, Gerald Deville, Count Dracula. What the fuck is his name? Hank Quinlan, Ned Guy, ha um, Harley, Haley. What the fuck? Harley, Harley. Oh my God. Mary Lee, Beetlejuice and the Queen. I don't know the, char the character names or not, you know. I want to say the guy from The Swimmer, it's going to be Burt Lancaster, I'm not going to say. Ned. Um, yeah, but thanks for watching. Um, hopefully this was fun. Peace.